Dismantle are uh, all Western Mass based, and we are very grateful to have. I'm just noticing this incredible panel of women, right? <laughs> Who are leading the way? Who are leading the way? Leading boldly and very collaborative and supportive of one another. Um, so, first we have Deb McLaughlin and Deborah. Deb, I can't, I, I don't know what I call you in public. Yeah, okay, Deborah's fine in public. Um, she works as the coordinator for the Franklin County and North Quabbin Region Opioids Task Force, and I've gotten to know her very well, which is a 400-member entity working to address the impact of the opioid epidemic in rural Mas Western Massachusetts through its executive council and five active working committees addressing issues of housing, workforce development, health, public safety, education, prevention, treatments, and recovery. Prior to that, Deb spent 25 years working in the social policy field, specializing in public-private partnership models and practices that affect social change in the areas of substance misuse, community development, after school, and early childhood education. A full bio of each of our panelists is available in your packet. We also have with us today, DA, Berkshire County DA, Andrea Harrington. Welcome. Great to have you. Andrea is the first woman to be elected Berkshire County's, as Berkshire County's district attorney. She is a graduate of the Emerge Massachusetts program and a co-founder of the Massachusetts Women Political Caucus. Harrington's reform agenda has called for vigorously prosecuting dangerous offenders while improving public safety through prevention and community engagement. As DA, she's established a Berkshire County domestic and Sexual Violence Task Force and has changed the way that the district court cases are assigned to prosecutors to ensure more continuity for victims and criminal cases. And we also have, no stranger to us, Dr. Ruth Poti, who is the Director of Addiction Services Behavioral Health Network and also a family physician here in Western Mass. She is currently the medical director for the Franklin County House of Corrections, the director of addiction services for Behavioral Health Network, and the medical director for the Pioneer Valley Regional High School District, and also ser serves as the co-chair of the Healthcare Solutions Committee of the Opioid Task Force of Franklin uh, County in the North Quabbin region. She was named Franklin County's Doctor of the Year by the Massachusetts Medical Association in 2015, and she is very modest, but you will find a short bio for her also in there. Um, also joining this panel, we have Liz Wynott, who is the Director of Harm Reduction at Tapestry. Um, she has extensive experience in substance use disorder, HIV AIDS, and hepatitis C, including more than 10 years in managing HIV prevention program. She is a member of numerous boards, including Help and End HEP CMA Coalition, a statewide hepatitis C advocacy coalition. She's also on the task force and on the Hampshire Hope Task Force and the Hampden County Addiction Task Force. So she's very experienced in the topic. And then lastly, we have Deirdre Calvert with us, who is the director of the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services here in Massachusetts for the Department of Public Health. Uh, she has a lot of experience overseeing prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery support services, and she has held numerous leadership roles, including uh, director of a large methadone clinic, director of psychotherapy of office-based opioid treatment clinics, and director of, private, of a private resident, residential facility in Boston. So we have a very accomplished panel with us today. So, Deborah, my first question is for you. We've heard a lot about collaboration and certainly the work that we're doing here in Western Mass has been cited as been very collaborative and very innovative. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the importance of these community coalitions, um, the Opioids Task Force, over 400 members. Why is that important? Great, happy to. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, awesome. So it's really a privilege to be here this morning and to really talk about such an urgent public health emergency in our region. And I want to especially thank the Mass Health Policy Forum and their partners, especially to Mike Doonan and to Rob Bowler and the rest of the Brandeis team 
for the incredible work on this uh, task right now. So before I answer that very good question, I just have a couple of quick questions for the audience. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you, aside from your professional lives, actually know someone who's been impacted by substance use disorder? How many of you have a child in your life between the ages of zero and five? How many of you know children who are going to be starting preschool or kindergarten this, this year? I'll circle back to why I'm asking those questions and how it relates to the community coalition work in just a second. So much in the same way that we would be unable to walk or lift anything without the presence of connective tissues in our body, we simply are unable to address the opioid crisis without community collaborations which done well binds us together in a shared purpose to coordinate and leverage community resources to prevent, intervene, treat, and offer multiple pathways of recovery for those impacted by substance use disorder or opioid use disorder. While I'm not going to address those key foundational elements because I know many of us work together well in this room and there's a great community resource called the Community Toolbox kind of developed by the University of Kansas, I want to drill down briefly to talk about five other elements that I have found to be crucial for those of us in Western Mass and the North Quabbin region working together to address the opioid crisis through community building. First, nothing about us without us. Um, as the site of the Shays Rebellion, Western Mass, as those of us know, um, which reportedly influenced George Washington to become president of the United States, um, but I'll let the constitutional scholars uh, verify that. Um, we're keenly attuned to the importance of having a voice in issues or policies that affect us. This concept is especially crucial in fighting the opioid crisis where it's essential to have individuals with lived experience and their loved ones at the table to help us determine what life-saving strategies are needed. Number two, I want to talk briefly about the art and science of implementation. There's an art and science to this. Um, we know, for example, that it can take up to 17 years for research evidence to reach clinical practice. We know from our practical experience that it can take years to, to successfully implement a project. It's, under, it's important to understand this dynamic because of the political and funding environments and cycles in which community collaborations are expected to thrive. They obviously don't seek up um, with those funding cycles or political environments. Um, which leads to more of the art of implementation. We know as Western Mass Community Coalition Task Force and leaders, we often have to evaluate when to expend our political capital, when to speak up, when to have the uncomfortable conversations, and to take risks, because we know by not doing so, we jeopardize lives or inadvertently exploit people who've uh, suffered so much as a result of this epidemic. Number three, managing change. As Western Mass Opioid Task Forces and coalitions and the folks who guide them, we deeply understand and are skilled in managing change. We know the difference between solving technical problems and addressing adaptive challenges, which often, by definition, are complex and volatile. We know, for example, as was noted in Rob's uh, great talk earlier today, we're still reeling from record opioid deaths in last year compared to the rest of the state. And we're also preparing for the next wave, which is meth, this is some of the things that we've been learning about. Um, also the HIV clusters that are popping up uh, because of shared needle use, increased risk of hep C. It kind of reminds me of like a family of tornadoes that we're trying to manage like all at the same time um, with limited resources. Which leads me to number four, collective impact. Uh, while it may be faster to go it alone, we are stronger together. We need to draw upon our, our culture of collaboration in the region to embrace uh, the power of collective impact, to help us work across multiple sectors, to identify that common agenda, shared measurement, continuous communication, et cetera. Um, which leads me to the last point as well, health equity. This work all needs to be done through a health equity lens that regardless of race, ethnicity, class, gender, offender status, addiction, or sexual preference, we can't overestimate the power of community collaborations to promote health equity as we consider the impacts of opioid and substance use disorders among our communities. So circling back to why I asked those questions at the very beginning, 
We have to use our collective and harness this power in this room. Our personal passion, because of the lived experience we have, our professional tools that we've amassed over the course of our careers, to really help address adverse childhood experiences, um, which we know can lead to a further trauma and addiction in, and later in life. And how can we use this opportunity as a springboard, um, that personal investment and passion, to be able to affect the current generation of, of children that are entering school right now and that are in our lives while we're also tending to um, the issues at hand. So I look forward to looking, continuing to work with all of you um, to help address uh, these long-term and short-term issues. Thank you. Thank you. And DA Harrington, as you heard this morning, there's a lot of interest in your area in the intersection of the criminal justice system and the opioids crisis. What are some of the trends that you've seen and how are you working with community in a way that is non-stigmatizing? Thank you for that question. And you know, I, I think that the fact that I've been elected to be district attorney demonstrates um, that our community in Berkshire County really expects to see a treatment-based approach to the opioid problem that we see in our community. Uh, we have, in, in Berkshire County, we have been somewhat behind Franklin and Hampshire County because we haven't had the kind of uh, political leadership that embraced a model of best practices and working on destigmatizing opioid abuse. So we have a lot of opportunity in this area to improve outcomes. And you can see, I was a defense attorney before I was a prosecutor, and you could see how the war on drugs that was very much still active in Berkshire County has had a devastating impact on our community. 6% of the population of Berkshire County is addicted uh, to substances. Uh, we see this play out every day in the courts. And you know what we're seeing. You know I'm in a position where I'm trying to make a system that was not designed to really deal in a meaningful way with mental health issues and substance use disorder. Make it do something it wasn't designed to do. Um, and we see some innovations, um, like the drug court, for example. Uh, when I started in January, we had eight participants in the drug court in Berkshire County. We're up to over 30 participants. I'm very proud of that, and that has to do with you know my office working collaboratively with the court um, in making that happen. We're working on bringing diversion programs, and so my interest is in get, keeping people who are struggling with substance use disorder, mental health issues, the results of poverty out of the criminal justice system. I've had the opportunity to really learn about what other communities are doing here locally, nationally, and internationally to bring those kinds of approaches to Berkshire County. Um, but I think ideally, in an ideal world, the criminal justice system wouldn't have much to do at all with treating uh, dealing with opioid problems or dealing with mental health. It's really something for the medical community to be addressing. And, you know, we can certainly um, build programs to get people into treatment sooner, which is what we are working on doing and, and working on keeping low-level offenders out of the system. I think my big challenge that we're grappling with is what do we do about crimes that are, I think, fall within the realm of violent crimes, like breaking into people's homes and holding up liquor stores and those kinds of things. What do we do about those kinds of crimes that do, I think, present significant public safety risks that are fueled by substance use disorder and that are fueled by you know, underlying mental health conditions? And I had an opportunity to visit Portugal and to see their approach to substances and their drug policy. And when I asked them this question, their response was, well, we don't have those kinds of crimes here. We don't have that problem. And they don't have that problem because people are getting treatment uh, for, their, for their medical issues. So um, you know, we, we need to continue to make more advancements. And I'm very, very happy to see uh, some law enforcement officers here today. Um, you know, I, people in law enforcement really 
do recognize this problem and are grappling with this and looking for a more proactive, productive approaches. We are working on bringing a program to Berkshire County called LEAD. It's Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. It started in Seattle. Um, it's in Albany, New York. We've been learning from them. And it's, it's a tool to give officers, um, instead of making an arrest, they can make referrals to social workers for these lower level offenses. I think funneling people out of the criminal justice system early in the process makes economic sense, and I think that it will really contribute to destigmatizing substance use disorder, which is the biggest barrier to people getting treatment. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. So as we switch to the uh, medical perspective on this, this morning we heard from Dr. Kerouac. Um, I also want to acknowledge his work and the work of um, the team over at Franklin Medical, um, Ron Bryant, and all that he's been doing as a CEO uh, in conjunction with Dr. Poti and others um, on this issue. So switching to the more medical aspect of it, um, Dr. Poti, uh, we hear that medication-assisted treatment is now the gold standard um, for dealing with opioid use disorder. We were wondering if you could comment on what that is, what is MAT specifically, and what have you seen in Western Mass in terms of um, trends and effectiveness? When I was in college, I moved to Texas to work for the governor of Texas, and I worked for her for five years, traveling the state. And one of the things I learned is that you never even listen to the question that's being asked. You're just going to say whatever the hell you want anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my friend. So I, I'm, I'm totally I'm, irrelevant here. <laughs> totally irrelevant. You're not. She is awesome, right? This is the woman who's running our small community college and is uh, going to be leading the efforts of community colleges throughout the entire country. But I may, I may get to the answer to this. <laughs> so I just want to comment to have the DA of Berkshire County throw out Portugal as the model of care that we should be looking at. That's throwing down the gauntlet. And that really is, when you look at the data, at the countries in our world where the biggest difference has been made, it is places where ready, easy access to medication-assisted treatment is available, period. And the number one treatment is actually methadone. And I'm going to go there because I don't really have a choice. Um, I want to acknowledge that there are many paths to recovery, period. And I don't care what path you're on. I want your life to be fully actualized. I want you to feel good about yourself and look in the mirror and realize that you are a human that is worth being loved. And the most important person to love you is yourself. And that is the hardest part of getting better, is the self-esteem building and the self-love. And Kenny was talking about that. And it's the hard one that is, takes a long time to get to. Um, but the path that somebody might take to getting better is their path, and our job is to not to judge it, our job is to make it available. So one of the things I'll say is that for seven years we have been working like dogs in Western Mass to address this issue, and I want shout outs from the room, but I want you to pause for a minute and think what we have done in seven years time. We have made Narcan available everywhere. Franklin County is the fourth county in the nation for distribution of Narcan. Woo. I got a phone call from NPR saying, what the hell is happening in Franklin County? You guys are handing out Narcan like candy. I'm like, yes, we are. Thank goodness for that. It's something to be proud of, right? When you look at the number of lives saved by emergency responders, by police, it's because they, we, have every, we have Narcan in every patrol car and every patrol car in this state. And our first responders are saving lives on a daily basis. We have shifted the conversation about addiction. We recognize it's a chronic medical disease. It is no different than depression, diabetes, any other organ impacted disease. This is normal conversation that we're having here. When you look at what the justice system has done, what our correctional system has done, judges haven't just shifted 90 degrees, they have shifted at 179 degrees in how they think about this. The fact that Kenny starts his story with probation, that's not what most people think someone's gonna say, right? But sometimes our probation officers are the number one champion standing in the corner, cheering somebody along, giving good guidance. That doesn't happen in many other states, right? This is something to be really proud of as a Massachusetts resident, which is most of us in this room. There's so many things that we have done well. It's awesome, right? When you think about the fact that Franklin County, three and a half years ago, did not have 
any acute treatment available now, thanks to BSAS and other funders. We have an excellent ATS, we have a CSS, we have a jail diversion program. This stuff is critical as the very first baby step towards getting better. But guess what? Detox doesn't actually work. All it is is the first step to plan a better path for yourself, right? But we need it available to people. You need to be able to walk in. You need to be able to walk in today, and then you need to be able to walk in again two weeks from now when it didn't work the first time. Get a different plan. My point is, is that lots of things have happened, right? And we all know, everybody in this room knows that you are part of this. You're part of the story of these shifts that have happened. But I would argue that we have hit a giant three foot thick, mile high brick wall. And that brick wall is the federal government and federal regulations regarding what we can do to help people get the treatment they need. And this brick wall doesn't need to be taken down brick by brick. We don't have time for that. This thing needs to be exploded. And I'm going to point out two things specifically right this second. The first is the fact that our access to overdose prevention sites is zero other than our very brave sister city in Philadelphia, which will be taken down. We know the federal government's gonna step in and close that place down, but I am telling you, we know that return to use in the first year of recovery is incredibly common, it is to be expected, and if you're gonna use the first time at nine months after nine months of sobriety to celebrate your birthday, I sure as hell want you to do it while Liz is standing by. That's what I want to have happen. I want you to do it in my office, I want you to do it in a safe place where we can keep you alive alive, period. And this is federal regulation that is preventing this from happening, right? Everybody in this room drove here today in a vehicle with an airbag. You know why? Because people have car accidents and we're trying to prevent you from dying. And sometimes that accident was your fault, right? You were drinking, you were driving too fast, you were texting on your phone, I was whipping back some goldfish to some crying toddler in the back, right? <laughs> right? So you can blame me for the car accident, but you should still try to keep me alive, right? Every car has an airbag. That's just the rule, right? Nobody gets in the way of that. We know people will return to use. Let's keep them alive and get them what they need while it's happening, period. That rule needs to be gone. In case our Eastern Mass folks didn't know, we're very passionate in this part of the state. <laughs> The second thing that needs to happen is we need easy access to medically assisted treatment. And the three evidence-based drugs for uh, medications for opiate use disorder are naltrexone, methadone, and buprenorphine. Uh, and I'm not going to dive in super hard on all three of them right now, but these are very effective drugs. They work as well as most of my blood pressure medicines work. They work about as well as most of my diabetes work. They work a hell of a lot better than the antidepressants do. And they work better by a long shot than any of my nicotine replacement. These are effective drugs for people who would benefit from them. They need them available to them. And the hardest one to get when you live in rural western Massachusetts is methadone. And I am so outraged by this. This thing keeps me awake at night. It's kept me awake at night for years on end, that I, as a primary care doctor, can prescribe methadone for chronic pain. I can give you 30 milligrams three times a day. You can walk into Walgreens and you can walk out with a bottle for 360 pills, period, right? Because you have spinal stenosis and you're 62 years old. It's not going to be responsive to any other treatment. And you need it because it allows you to function during the day, right? But you have the disease of chronic pain. But once you walk in there with the disease of addiction, you can no longer walk into your primary care office and get any methadone. In fact, you have to go to the other side of the tracks, somewhere in some like building where you're stigmatized. And by the way, we're full. We've been full and closed to new patients on and off for most of the last two years. So welcome to Franklin County and Hampshire, Hampshire County, where our access to this life-saving drug is really not there. Well, forget about Franklin and Hampshire. Live in North Quabbin or South Quabbin, where you have to drive 50 minutes east or west to access the gold standard, most effective, cheapest drug available to save your life. It is unacceptable. And the barriers to care, the barriers to methadone is federal, period. I know BSAS would, would downregulate it if they could. They would, they would, she would, I know she would. Um, they would get rid of all the rules and regulations, right? But these rules and regulations, for anybody in this room who's actually walked through this, it's insane. We, and I'm looking over at my Franklin County House of Corrections here, we would have done methadone three years ago because it's evidence-based care and it's part of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution is for us to provide medical care to any patient under in our care. So guess what? It took us 54 weeks of literal tears and labor to get our uh, full methadone license at the Franklin County House of Corrections. 
we cannot find another jail in the country that's actually succeeded in doing it. They often contract out with others because it is such a giant pain in the ass. We have our full license. Do I have methadone in my building yet? No, amazingly, I still don't. I had to <laughs> fill out a form that was in triplicate with carbon paper and while it had a six paragraph on how to tear it apart. If you rip it, it doesn't work. I ripped it. Right? I can't even tell you, it's like 1972 documenting. That's what I have going on. The barriers to accessing this drug are so crazy. We need to call SAMHSA on a daily basis and we need to be advocating with our federal legislative people. This has to go. It All needs right. to be redone from scratch, not just making small changes. Huge changes have to be made to make this drug available in primary care. It should be administered by pharmacists in a pharmacy. We should be able to co-locate a methadone clinic with a community health center. I only need to take care of 50 people in North Quabbin. I don't need a 1,600 patient unit there. I need small numbers. When I have small numbers, I can't afford a $10,000 safe that gets wired to the police station, right? I can't afford that. I am being asked to buy a $12,000 software program to interact with my liquid methadone uh, distributor. I have, I'm going to have fewer than five patients at the Franklin County House of Corrections on methadone. I refuse to buy a $12,000 software program. I have this thing called a pen and a piece of paper to keep <laughs> track of my methadone. This kind of methadone industrial complex that is, exists is because nearly every methadone clinic in this nation is run by a for-profit company that is actually backed by like, I don't know, name the investment company. That's who really owns them, right? This is a money-making scheme, and when you're out to make money, you don't mind having to jump through some hoops and spending that much money on software. This drug needs to be made available everywhere, and we need to think differently about how it is accessed. So this has to change, and until right. this changes, people will continue to die. Okay. We're strong advocates, and as you can see, she did answer my question after all. I did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Liz, we're now turning to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Tapestry and why you embrace the philosophy, the approach of reducing harm, harm reduction, and why is that a superior approach compared to alternative approaches that may be more of a barrier? I'll try to answer that. Um, so first I just wanted to say I'm really happy to be here today. I got my master's in public health here at UMass Amherst in 2009. Um, and it was actually while I was here, I got, my, I got an internship at Tapestry. And that's when I started working at the Northampton Needle Exchange. It was the only needle exchange in existence west of Boston. And it continued to be the only needle exchange until Holyoke successfully opened in 2012. And um, I feel like I just want to step back for a minute and talk, try, to, try to talk a little bit more about stigma because I, I hear that word a lot and it's just kind of, I think we say it a lot but I don't know if we all really understand it and I'm honestly still continuing to try to understand it but in, in full of form. But I think the first thing to know is it's not always blatant and it's not always intentional and, and honestly we all have it. It's our belief system um, and it's just how we operate and how we learn. And it's really, I think, made up of three things. The first thing is ideas and how we look at somebody. Um, so for example, someone that's using drugs, um, they may look a certain way or may, we may have experiences with them where we think that they can't take care of themselves, they can't make healthy decisions, they need to be saved, they just don't have any control. And that often leads to beliefs and actions such as, um, um, sorry, I wrote notes because I was like, there's three parts of this that I want to say. Uh, so it leads to prejudice and beliefs. Um, and some beliefs are is that I don't want them around me. I don't want them in my backyard. Um, if anybody's been to Holyoke recently, you'll see a lot of street signs that say no on Yale. And that's a... Uh, a thing going on by different community members that are saying, no, I don't want this treatment center on my block because it's going to ruin my neighborhood, and that's like hardcore nimbyism. And it's interesting when we started, when I when I started try, like when I started at Tapestry, I really started to pay attention to this stigma and like what is stigma, and it kind of just hit me in my face because I've never, I mean, I have, but I guess like I've I've, it's been rare for me to see another form of stigma 
that's been at the same level as it is with people that use drugs. And I see it at all levels. I see it within our systems. I see it in our healthcare system. I see it in our treatment systems. I see it in our incarceration system. And again, I don't, it's not, a lot of it isn't intentional, but I think it's been a part of history. And it's something that we always need to evaluate and think about because a lot of that has led to a lot of negative consequences for people that use drugs. And, you know, and I'm specifically just, my heart is really with active drug users. I firmly believe in recovery. I firmly believe in prevention. But I find that that, that population has really been left behind for a long time and continues to be left behind. And it's not until we really try to think about how we approach and what and how we work with people that I think the real change can occur. And so those no on Yale signs, which are prejudice, you know, beliefs, they can often lead to acts of discrimination. And so those may be things like not allowing methadone clinics, you know, um, just having like hardcore regulations, which makes it almost impossible for people to get it. Or, you know, just, just many, many other things. Um, and so I think a lot of what we need to do is not just about what we need, but it's also about how we think. And we need to try to like dismantle those beliefs. And I think the more we try to break down what is stigma, the more it can actually happen. And at Tapestry, I think that's something that I really try to do in my own work every day because I also, of course, have stigma and belief in all sorts of realms, not just with drug use, but just in, it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's how we, I think, it's a part of learning and a part of development. Um, and, you know, at Tapestry, I grew up in Northampton. I um, used Tapestry services when I was growing up. And a major part of Tapestry, aside from the programs I oversee now, which are uh, harm reduction programs, um, syringe service programs, is our sexual and reproductive health clinics. Um, his, Tapestry has a long history of providing low access birth control and sexual and reproductive health care to um, people in need. And there's clinics in all four counties. And although that's, I think that the history of harm reduction um, is really tied to drug use, harm reduction can actually apply to any topic, including sexual and reproductive health care. So, you know, um, teenagers that can go into tapestry and get needed health care without their parents' permission, which is essential to reproductive rights. And, you know, that's just one of the many things. And so when tapestry brought on um, our more HIV prevention program in the 90s at the height of the HIV epidemic, the agency kind of followed that line, just really needing to provide low threshold care. And so services have been created, they've continued to be created, such as needle exchanges, such as wide Narcan distribution of people that use drugs, um, and many other services, but they all rest in the inherent belief that drug users can make their own decisions and that they are able to make healthy choices for themselves. And so within the work that I do and within I, the, the training and the development with the staff that I oversee, I really try to bridge that message that it's like we need to be accomplices. We need to be allies with the people that we work with. We are not smarter than anybody. We do not know anything more than the people coming in the door. And if we don't really look at that individual as an individual and work with them from where they're at in that moment, then we'll lose them in the sense that people will shut down. That stigma that's so prominent is, is so inherent and so internalized with people that use drugs that it's like, you know, when we, when we talk about recovery or um, just talking about like self-love or, or however, it's, it's, it's so hard to kind of get past the stigmatization and the discrimination felt when you use drugs. It takes a very long time. Um, and, you know, I'm so glad to hear that overdose prevention sites were talked about today. And the other two things that I just want to see, that I just want to say are, are very problematic in my work with people that use drugs. The first thing is lack of hepatitis C treatment. Um, you know, it's close, they're about 30 or 40 percent of the people that we tested last year came back with active hepatitis C virus. We made next to no successful referrals. And that's because um, it's incredibly, incredibly hard to get referrals. Even though MassHealth will cover treatment, and just to make it clear, MassHealth does cover treatment for people that are actively using drugs. There are no requirements around that. There's just this belief that if you treat somebody that's using drugs with hepatitis C, they're just gonna get it again, or they're gonna be irresponsible and not like finish the treatment. And 
that stigmatization, again, that belief, that discrimination that's happening has been internalized so much also by people that use drugs that I'm talking to people every day that like just don't think they can get it and just don't want to try and, and honestly don't think that they deserve it because they're actively using drugs. And there's something very wrong with that. And I think that things like that... <laughs> Hepatitis C treatment, it's something that's available, and just like with having so many people in the medical field in this room, it's something that can easily be changed, especially focusing on our community of Western Mass, because it's, it's a community, we know each other, we network, and there's things that, that can actually happen now to really improve the quality of life for people that come into services like we need, because again, like Ruth, Ruth so describes so well, it's not up to us to judge who's coming in, it's, us, it's up to us to provide treatment that people need. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Teacher, it's wonderful to have you here with us um, today. So can you talk to us about what an effective continuum of care for opioid use disorder should look like and what the department is doing to ensure that in Western Mass we do have access? I would be happy to. So I just want to say, oh, Dr. Pody, we're going to be good friends. So <laughs> I am the director of BSAS today. After, after that, I might not be, but I, am, <laughs> but I couldn't agree more. Um, so I have notes because I'm a good rule follower, too. So I have notes, and I'm ready to go. So there is no one-size-fits-all for anybody in any treatment. So I want to get that out of our heads, but we do know that small and rural communities face their particular challenges. But what we do know that works is improving the lock, access to naloxone and other harm reduction tools, promoting access to the three FDA approved medications, um, and ensuring availability of ongoing treatment and recovery support. So what has BSAS done uh, the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services has done. Since 2016, we have increased the number of beds by 160. So as Dr. Pody pointed out, we have 32 beds, you know, new ATS beds, CSS beds, and we're not done. Um, some of the other things that we've done, we've supported the expansion of the overdose and education and naloxone distribution programs in Pittsfield, North Adams, and Greenfield. We funded new OBOTs, or opiate-based um, office treatment in North Adams. Uh, again, in uh, Pittsfield, Great Barrington. Um, we've provided funding for the Opiate Echo prog program, which is the telehealth model, which uses teleconferencing uh, to increase access and training. Um, we've supported the implementation of a pilot to increase the access of medications for OUD for people who are um, reentering the community from incarceration, um, from Hamden County, Hampshire, Franklin, Houses of Correction. Um, we've awarded the funding to two recovery support centers. We've provided uh, funding for eight new co-occurring enhanced beds, which is another thing that we're not talking about, is how the intersection of mental health and substance use needs to be handed, uh, taken care of hand in hand. It needs to be a parallel process. Um, partnered with our Bureau of Community Health and Prevention uh, to develop first steps together, a home for visiting and recovering coaches for pregnant and parenting women um, with opiate use disorders in Pittsfield and Springfield. And we've expanded our Moms Do Care program, um, including a site in Greenfield. Um, and that's a, with a partnership through Bay State Franklin uh, Medical Center. So despite all these efforts, we know that way too many people are falling through the cracks. And our data is showing that almost 50% of the people who overdose and die have never touched our services. Wow. And that's just crazy. Yeah, 50%, that's what our data is showing us. So we have to do more. We have to be out more and we have to do more efforts to reach those individuals who have historically had been difficult to engage and to support their transitions. Um, for those who do enter care, we need to make sure that we keep getting them care. And I keep thinking, I had all these stories. As everyone talked, I'm like, oh my God, yes. And oh my God, yes. And when my first internship was in um, Cambridge Health Alliance in 1992, and it was, um, <laughs> and this is what, this is stigma. We were in two trailers in a parking lot at Cambridge Health Lines. We didn't even have an office. We were in a trailer in a parking lot. And I, had, I went to class one day and I said, oh, we had somebody who came in. It was like their 300th attempt at detox. And somebody said, why would you do that? And I'm like, because maybe the 300th first time they're going to get it. Like, right? They're going to get it. So, so what do we need to do? We need to keep funding a post-overdose prevention program that's offered in-home, home-based, outreach, support, after 911 for an overdose uh, prevention programs. 
what else, what other efforts are we doing? We're funding a transitional addiction program model in Springfield that works to identify individuals with opiate use disorder in inpatient settings to begin into, uh, induction of MOUD and provide ongoing linkages to community-based care post-discharge. And we're working with ATSs and community-based providers to ensure access to MOUD and seamless transitions to community-based uh, care upon um, discharge through bridging the gap initiatives. One of the other licensing things we're looking at is really to focus on the, the ATS not always working for everybody, is making sure that we have access to acute withdrawal in an outpatient setting by doing induction in every place that we possibly can. Um, most importantly, uh, though we know the key to an effective system is community and stakeholder engagement, collaboration and engagement. Um, I have only heard amazing things about the MOPSIs and the SAPSIs out here in Western Mass, and those are the uh, coalitions and community uh, partnerships that are out here um, in each uh, county, Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin have incredibly well-developed um, opiate task forces. Um, these collaboratives have organized public education events, organized subcommittees that bridge gaps in communities. They bring in new funding and they make changes to reduce the stigma and improve, and improve the provider relationships, provider linkages, and advocate for more services. Um, so I'm really thankful to be here, and I'm happy to answer any more questions, and I'm really excited to be on a panel with so many um, amazing women. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So I will, rather than having the second set of questions, I think we have tons of questions from the audience. I think they've been very patient all day. We have um, two mics, one over there, one over here. Um, and if you're just making a comment, we want you to be very succinct. Um, if I do like this, it's come on, let's wrap it up. And if it's like this, like, and now. Um, so just be very considerate. We have lots of people who are interested in this topic. I don't want to be rude to you, but the third level, if you need me to shut you down, um, I will be unafraid to do so. Um, so yeah, we all have some sort of courage, and I guess mine is to keep this moving along. Um, so with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, uh, feel free to come up and ask those questions. I also have some leftover questions from the prior panel that are more appropriate for this panel um, that I can also go to to make sure that your voices are heard. So don't stampede to the mics or anything, um, but we're ready for some questions. If you could say who you are um, um, briefly and what you do, if, if you care to. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Shannon, and I'm with First Steps Together. I, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Fantastic. Let's see. I can bend down a little bit. I'm Shannon. I'm with First Steps Together in Fitchburg, Mass. Um, some of the things I've noticed, um, I'm going to start off. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. There's a lot of people in here. Um, I'm a person on long-term recovery, um, and I'm also on MAT. Congratulations. And I'm finding, thank you. Um, I'm finding a lot when I go into the ERs or to find a new provider because my last one treated me like crap, excuse my language, that a lot of the time it's one of the two things. They're either quick to write me a prescription for an ailment that I have and try to cover up my problem. If it's, you know, I'm in some type of pain, it's quick to not ask any questions. They don't want to send me for tests. They don't want to take any blood work. They just want to give me an opioid. Or as soon as they find out that I'm on MAT and I'm a person in long-term recovery, they shut me down immediately. So I'm wondering what are some of the things that we can do to work together to get both of those things, both of those stigmas, like try to get them stopped. I mean, I remember going as a kid to the doctors with an ailment and I remember blood work, asking questions, sending me for tests. And now it's not only me, but the moms that I work with, when we go to the doctor, they don't even look at you in the face anymore, and they're just quick to write a prescription. And I'm tired of that. So I'm just wondering what some of the things that we can do to stop that. Thank you for your courage. I'm gonna just uh, comment a little bit on this one. You know, I, I think we have to train clinicians again and again and again, and I've been a doctor for 20 years, and we are a hard group to change. That's a fact. That Deb mentions it takes 17 years of research and evidence to put something in clinical practice. You know, I remember things really well from my internship year, and sometimes I'm even still doing those things, even though I know there's no evidence behind it anymore because it just stuck with me from 20-something years ago. So doctors and clinicians and PAs need to be trained again and again. And one of the things I will say is that our young people going into medical school now, 
this issue really matters to them. It just does. They are into this. They care. They have the same way that sort of the knowledge about um, LBGQ transgender issues and the young generations. Like I get corrected at home with my my pronouns every single day, and I'm like, God, I'm so old and stupid, and my kids never make the mistake because this younger generation will do a better job, but that is still too long to wait. I'm gonna defend, and I don't ever mean to sound defensive, primary care these days is a dreadful business as a primary care doctor for the last 20 years, and this sort of notion of, oh my God, I've got seven minutes or less, and I have four rooms going, and the fastest solution for your problem right now, true or not, is me writing a script, is a terrible way that our, um, our medical system is now working, right? Primary care doctors are poorly paid and they're under the gun and you need to see 28 patients a day just to break even and pay your staff. So you're gonna do a crappy job by your patients and sitting there slowly and really listening to somebody and teaching them some slow mindfulness breathing and encouraging some exercise and hooking them up to a therapist, that's gonna take 18 minutes that we don't have. The system is broken for primary care and I'm so sad as a primary care doctor to tell you what you already know. So there's not a pill for every problem. I cannot say that strongly enough. In fact, pills really should be fifth line for most things, but until the insurance companies give people the time and space to really talk about good evidence-based other stuff, it will continue to be this model. I'd like to add briefly to that um, too. I, I really appreciate that comment. Thank you for sharing. It also uh, reminds me of the value and importance of peer-led recovery centers, and depending on where you live, if you have the opportunity to seek out the support of the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community or your other peer-led community center, um, th that, those folks have been really instrumental in this kind of advocacy and training that Ruth was talking about. And, and so much so that in Franklin County, we're working with the Western Mass um, RLC to do a trauma-sensitive training in medical settings, which has been uh, proven to be really a powerful and effective tool, and we want to do more of that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll take the next question. Please get as close to the mic as you can. Okay, this, I'm Marian Boeri. I'm from Bentley University, and I've been studying drug use uh, as an ethnographer for about 20 years. Um, you mentioned Portugal, and I just wanted everybody to know that Portugal decriminalized drugs, and they set up, um, they were called commissions of dissuasion that were made up of community members that were disengaged from the legal system. So I'm wondering if uh, we are going to work on doing that as well. And uh, along with that, there's another evidence-based MAT that we are not talking about, no one mentioned, and that would be deacetylmorphine. I'd like to know if you'd like to address that as well, which is pharmaceutical grade heroin, which has worked in other countries. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I can address the first question. Uh, you know, the, the Portuguese model of decriminalizing drugs has been very effective in Portugal in terms of helping to reduce stigma and getting people into the medical based treatment that is going to be effective. You know, in my office, you know, as the district attorney, you know, I have the power to decide who we're going to prosecute and who we're not going to prosecute. So it's, you know, an easy step to say, oh, we're not prosecuting people for possession of drugs, which is really how my office functions. Um, it's, a, it's a tougher step to, to, to go the, the, the next step, which is to get people access to treatment, which I think is really critical in terms of, you know, building a healthy and thriving community in Berkshire County, and that's what I'm working on doing in terms of, you know, collaborating across our community and working on, you know, bringing more resources and, and finding ways of getting people, you know, into treatment and access to treatment. I, I will give you a cap of 30 seconds, Dr. Poti. Okay, seconds. <laughs> Part of what happens in methadone is, I mean, Portugal is the methadone van that drives around, which the DEA has banned. In, Port, in Port Berkshire County, you need a methadone van because Berkshire County is huge and it's covered in tiny little hill towns, so there's another thing. I have to say that um, a part of what would be in an overdose prevention site is the opportunity eventually of using medical grade heroin that we know is not contaminated with fentanyl and that is something that we should be advocating for. But I know you guys know this. This is a stepwise process and I can't even get methadone into my jail right now. Like the notion of getting medical grade heroin in the next year or two, not realistic, but yet it's still something for some of our people. It may be their best treatment because they have truly failed everything else. So I'm I am really open-minded, and I think many people are on that subject. Thank you for bringing it up. 
Thank you. We know you do really well speaking fast. Next. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I think I know almost everyone on the panel, but my name is Kat Allen, and I'm uh, the coordinator for the Communities That Care Coalition, which is a primary prevention coalition that serves Franklin County, and I know there are a number of other people representing primary prevention coalitions here. Um, and uh, this has been a fantastic panel, uh, really highlighting a lot of the amazing work that's happening in Western Massachusetts. Um, uh, and what I, and forgive me that this is slightly more of a comment than a question, but um, what I really wanted to highlight is that I feel like we haven't heard enough today about primary prevention. We've heard about naloxone, we've heard about you know, educating people about you know, the risks of prescription drug misuse and opioids, but what we also, we, we, if we're ever going to get to the root of this problem and the problems that will follow, we also need to be talking about working with young people to build social skills and emotional skills and to build connection to school, to family, to community. And these are the things that can help us get out of this epidemic and that will prevent the next epidemic. And this needs to be, you know, not at the expense of all the wonderful things that we've had here, but in addition to. And it's a piece that is so often left out of the puzzle. You know, I hear about the healing communities grant and it's so amazing there's a huge flood of resources but it's just to reduce overdose deaths in the next three years only and we need large investments in prevention we know what works in prevention there's a lot that works our community coalition has been around for 16 years and in that time we've seen substance use reduced among youth by more than half we used to be twice the national levels at alcohol use, binge drinking, marijuana, you name it. And now we're at national levels or below. And yet, our coalition is losing its funding. I have someone retiring, I cannot replace her. It's down to one person. We know what we can do and we don't have the funding for it. Massachusetts, of Massachusetts's own funding, only puts, puts no money into primary prevention. And that's not BSAS's fault. I know if you had the money, you absolutely would. But we as a state have not invested in primary prevention at all. The only money that comes for it, for it is small amounts of federal funding. And that's not acceptable. So what can we do to increase the focus on primary prevention? Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you. It's easier to shut down the people you know. All right. Uh, thank, thanks, Kat, for bringing that up. I, uh, this is so crucial uh, for those of us who live and work in Franklin County and, and know well the, the great work of the Family Drug Court. Um, the UMass Medical uh, School just in the last year did a research study that showed 100% of, of the children involved, the young children involved in that program or impacted by that program had an ACE score of four or more. So we know if we don't intervene in the, in the ways that you're talking about now, um, as Regist Register Merrigan has talked about on many occasions, here's our future litigants. Here's our future folks that may, that may be suffering from addiction. So really looking at how we can create a, a, the, the political will, the strategies to really support what we know the, the evidence shows us, the data is so powerful here, is ab absolutely you're on point with that. And, and hopefully, using this as a, a, one of the platforms, we can make sure that we can work with all of our partners to address that. Thank you. Any other comments? No? All right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deborah Berkovitz. I work for the Department of Public Health. And um, I direct First Steps Together, which is a home visiting program supported by BSAS. And we are in three counties in Western Massachusetts. And I want to say that uh, two of the counties were the first two sites that were filled very quickly. And talking about primary prevention, I want to take it back even a little further, which is to say that when we think about harm reduction, people being able to live very functional lives, um, continuing to use substances, which is true of the majority of people who use substances, is they're still holding jobs, um, they're still you know, able to be parents, is that I want to suggest the very radical concept that most people who are parents and are using, that many people who are parents and are using, are able with adequate resources to continue parenting and to, con to continue to have custody of their kids. And that if we want to think about primary prevention, what we really should be dumping our dollars into, because there's a lot of talk about ACEs, is how do we support families to stay intact with the right supports? We know that home visiting services 
have incredibly good evidence base uh, for outcomes for kids and for parents, and that um, that I this is I mean I'm I'm going to say I probably I won't say what I'm going to say, but uh, just that that I think that if we want to be preventing ACEs, we want to think about how to keep kids in stable home environments, and how we see that that people that parents deserve the right to get the supports that they need to be able to parent their kids safely and in recovery. Thank you. Again, just to briefly comment on this, and I, I hope other panelists will too, but um, it's, it's clear from the work that we do in our region that parents who are suffering from substance use disorder deeply love their children, whether they have custody of them or not. And that's why the work of the Empower Program and the work that the North Quabbin Community Coalition is doing around family support services, uh, with the, the nurturing families training curriculum, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more about the importance of, of keeping families stable uh, and providing even more supports and integrated supports than we're, we're doing right now. Uh, because when that is disrupted, um, that is a, a traumatic event that young children suffer from and can have lifelong consequences. So I, I couldn't agree more that we need to do more to help families stay together. Um, we have Project Promise, we have the programs we've mentioned out here, we have Moms Do Care, and it's not enough. I think um, my women's service person has, has left the room, but she can correct me, but I think we have one of the only, um, in Massachusetts, uh, family-supported housing that includes men, which is in the nation. We only, you know, there's only two, and Massachusetts has one of them. So I wanna keep sure, um, make sure that men are included in this conversation, that we include fathers. Um, and, and yesterday we just had a conversation with our sister agency of DCF um, of how we can do a better job of keeping families together because that is going to be a protective factor and a primary preventative measure against uh, future generations who are gonna be using substances. So it's a conversation that we keep needing to have and we're not doing enough and we're, we're, we're keeping to try. So we're, we're happy to get any suggestions um, for, for more treatment programs because I think you guys have your finger on the pulse of what, what's also needed. Dr. Laputi, do you want to add to that? No, these guys do great. <laughs> I feel horrible now. Because <laughs> I know you talk so much about that in the role of men and fathers, so. <laughs> uh, great, all right, next, next comment. Hi, my name is Sharon Pinal, and I am a workforce development coordinator with Morgan Memorial Goodwill. We have clients referred to us from DTA. Um, many clients, all of them, are single mothers and fathers. I was originally working in Holyoke, Mass, two years. The first year, I kept handing out my business cards with water bottles to individuals who were on the streets, begging, asking for money. And they asked me, why aren't you, why aren't you discriminating against me? I said, because you're a person, you're a human being, and we all bleed the same color. Um, I had referred my clients who were some of the parents to Hope for Holyoke, and they help a couple of parents get clean, and some of them for, for their children. I'm also, I also was a single mother, and I live in Connecticut. My son is addicted. For 10 years. And he was on Suboxone and all those medical clinics, but he's still addicted to it and he's still trying to buy Suboxone because he can't get enough of it to get help. I can relate to these parents because I've lived in low income housing. I, I've lived in substance abuse. I've, I grew up in it. I have not, I didn't get affected except when I was a teenager. You know, being a teenager, we all want to have some fun. But I stopped because I became pregnant at 17. I just don't know how else I can help my clients' children, or the clients, or my kids. I mean, why, why, why can we go into, into uh, holistics therapy? Why, why do we need to go to more medication and make more money? I, I, I don't understand it. I know holistics is so expensive to get recovery, and I've been trying to push my son, but I cannot afford to send him there. Or my clients cannot afford to send their family there or my client cannot afford to go there because they don't have the money or the means, whether in Connecticut or Mass or throughout the nation. 
I, I just don't understand why we have to keep pushing Suboxone or Methadone. I'm not on the medical side, and I applaud everyone, all the panel, and everybody here for doing what you're doing because you are making a difference, believe it or not. You really are. I, I just, I, I don't know how to help them or my kid. I think we can get some thoughts on that here. Thank you. Thank you for having so much courage and for being so vulnerable. You know, I think every kid, go, you go first. Yeah, I, you know, I just think that your comment and your story goes to the larger issue from you know, what I've seen in, in my career growing up in, in Berkshire County and seeing what's happened to the economy there and seeing what my clients have endured and, you know, income inequality and a lack of opportunity is what drives so much of the pain and the despair that I see in my community. And it's, you know, I think that your comment goes to the bigger picture as to why do we have so many people in this country and in our cities and towns who are sad and, and are turning to substances to ease their pain. And I think every parent in the room hears you speak and it makes us feel your pain in a very real way because everyone in this room knows that this, your son is our son, right? We know that. And it's so hard to know how long and he struggled. Boy, if there were an easy solution for this one, we would have figured it out. And the problem with substance use disorder, it is it is not easily fixed. I may sit up here and be like, use the evidence-based medicine. I recognize a thousand percent, they don't work for everybody. At any given point, they work a part of the story and the rest of the story also has to fall into place. Everybody wants the magic wand cure. You want it for your boy and boy, it doesn't exist. What we know is takes what, what it, does it take to get better time? It takes a long time in recovery for your brain to heal. And the problem is, is what gets paid for is a seven day program, a 30 day program. Maybe if you're lucky, you've got yourself into a TSS or a long term living situation. And what we're really missing is that the money goes up front for these acute treatment programs. It costs a gazillion dollars, but there's very little in the way of long-term sober living, especially for moms, dads, people who are trying to actually parent together and raise their kids. There's so many ways in which you're trying to reach recovery, but you can't find a sober place to live. And if you don't have that, and you're living on the streets, living under a bridge somewhere, you are not gonna get better because your overall health is really miserable. And you know what? I would be using heroin every day too if I was living under bridge knowing the winter was coming because who wants to feel that right you need to numb up and that's the smart way to go drinking and drugging is the best way to numb up and so we need to support everybody we see and this stuff costs money it costs money up front but it's going to cost money at the back end because these people are going to end up in the ICU with the spinal abscess so pay now or pay later it's your choice yeah I just want to add something um Thank you for sharing. I think, you know, one thing that's been learned today is that there is no easy answer, and unfortunately, this, you know, is going to go on for a long time. But one, I think, showing up and talking in your voice is extremely powerful, and it's just really important, I think, to advocate and talk about the real experiences that we have, and that does affect policy and that does affect change. Um, you, you just, you mentioning the 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 panhandlers that you've come across. I, I just wanted to talk about also like in my work I come across a lot of people that are homeless and that don't have stable living and that also have an incredibly hard time accessing even emergency shelters. Um, there isn't an emergency shelter in Holyoke so people that go are there they have to either go to well they have to go to Springfield because that's the only closest place that has year-round emergency shelters and if it's in the winter they can either go to Springfield or to Northampton. Um, and unfortunately, you know, just going back to like stigma, um, I, I often see people that will, will go to the shelters that do exist that are mostly sober shelters and if um, they use heroin, they hide it, they have to lie to be able to get in and it's, it's easier because it doesn't smell like you can kind of easily hide it. But for people that are drinking alcohol, it's incredibly hard and I found that you know, for a lot of people drinking alcohol in the winter, there is no choice but to sleep on the street. And there's something really wrong with that. And I think like when we're thinking about what other supports do we need to provide, we again need to think about the population that's being left and that is at an extremely high risk to die. So what are we doing for those homeless people? 
we cannot place the judgment on that. You have to be the certain way. You have to stop using drugs in order to access treatment of any form, housing, anything. We really have to provide the support services first in order to see any form of change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just have a brief, a brief comment too, um, to build on all these incredible responses. But thank you for sharing your story. I think it's an, and your suffering with us. I think that this is uh, an example of the incredible suffering that we've seen as a result of a substance use disorder. And so, the two quick things I would recommend that in not to forget to take care of yourself. Um, that's one of the great things that you could actually do for your son, um, to, to be as healthy and strong as you can for him. And there's a great organization, Learn to Cope, um, that does a lot of, they know this, they live this. Um, there are people here from Learn to Cope if you want to talk to them. I see them all over here. You can raise your hands. There's Jerry, too. Uh, feel free to talk to them, because they have an incredible resource and know exactly what you're going through. So we, we'll take these two last questions. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Romo. I'm an MD-PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And um, I guess I have a question about a topic that I guess in my mind I call systemic primary prevention. And that is we know that you know, a big factor that caused this crisis, this epidemic, is really pharmaceutical companies pulling the wool over the eyes of physicians and regulators and, and a lot of people. And, I guess I worry about, you know, it was opioids now, and I worry what it's going to be in the future. You know, how do we as clinicians, how do we as people in public health, how do we as politicians, regulators, et cetera, how do we protect ourselves from being fooled by the next thing? How do we protect ourselves from being tricked into the next epidemic? How do we protect ourselves from that? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here and hope others do too. Um, Nothing infuriates me more to have seen how um, the opioid crisis or any opio or any substance uh, use related crisis has been monetized, um, and how the suffering has been monetized. Uh, how how it's made it's it's created uh, exploitation of all kinds, horrible exploitation. Um, so I, I think that if we can continue to build a movement that kind of focuses on things like primary prevention and other things that we know that work um, to help inoculate our communities so that we have more tools and resources at our disposal so that we can fight, continue to fight back against the profit motive that exists. Um, that's just part of this, sadly. And, and also I think the other part of it too where, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to see where Big Pharma, when they've made their private donations, for example, the Sackler families, that there's some accountability that's happening now uh, as a result of all this. There has to be accountability here um, because there's too many people have died, too much suffering has happened. It's just un unacceptable. I'll just say from a law enforcement perspective, uh, you know, my office very aggressively uh, investigates and prosecutes drug traffickers, and I think that for accountability against big pharma, I would expect to see criminal charges and people to actually be serving time behind bars. I just want to comment that this is a, a MD, PhD student. This is somebody in the pipeline to be a future doctor taking care of people, and this is a question he's asking. And so that gives me hope because, you know, I'm just going to say to him, but anybody else who's going to be a prescriber in the future, guess what? The pills don't work that well. Like, mm -hmm. all pills don't work that well. What makes people healthy? Well, uh, changes in their access to good quality food, having stable housing, not having to be freaked out about whether they can pay the oil bill or whether they're going to turn on their gas stove in order to stay warm. This is what improves the health of society. And when you look at the PERCH program or the combined program between UMass and Bay State, that's a program that's looking at population health and how we really improve our society. So the days of thinking writing a prescription is going to fix you, I'm sorry, we got to move on from that. And you should be suspect forever from anybody who's telling you that they got a magic fix. And it's not just about the drugs, it's about the medical devices too. We need to turn medicine on its head. We need to fund primary care and prevention, and we need to stop focusing on this one magic cure I have for your problem.
And you have our final word. Okay, so I'm a social worker. Please don't throw things at me. Uh, <laughs> can you come a little closer to the mic? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I, I had put in a question, so I want to kind of address that because I see it from a different aspect. And I know there's been a lot of questions in regards to it. So in regards to the program put in at Franklin County, people can't have access to any of those unless they're sentenced. That takes three, four, five, six months till somebody's sentenced. I've had many families in there who have no access to the transition plan, to medicated assisted programs, to nothing, because they're not, they're not sentenced. And then they leave and their judgment is to go to halfway houses. Guess what, there's no halfway houses. I also wanna talk about the, um, the programs at the courthouse. If we're gonna do a program at the courthouse, if we're gonna do family drug court, we need it a clinical based because those people are also from the area. So if you know somebody from the area and you're in that, that program, there, there's no clinical aspect to it. So people are getting turned away. So there's no overall systematic thing happening here. It's, it's pick and choose. So I hate to keep throwing at the prevention aspect of it, but there's, I, I don't feel like there's been any real answer to prevention. And so when we're looking at the safety and the risk of a child, you're looking at somebody who is actively using with no prevention model and, and a child who's at risk. So I just wanna kinda of throw that out there. Thank you. Now panel. Can I, I, the only part of her question I feel competent in responding to is the correctional side. So for those people in the room who aren't in corrections, what I think is, doesn't, isn't known to people is that most people who are in a jail are pre-sentenced, right? They have not gone to court, they don't have a true sentence, and that is 80% of the people we have on MAT at the jail are pre-sentenced. So that is, it is not the case that if you arrive that we don't take care of you. We do take care of you. Um, is it a little complicated? Yeah, it's super complicated work, because you may be here today and you're gone tomorrow and I didn't even know you were leaving, and then who was your warm handoff and can I write a script? Like, it's incredibly slippery people to take care of. And, it is challenging, but we've tried to figure out how to make it work. So it is the case, it may not have been the case three years ago that people who were pre-sentenced got treatment, but they do now. Um, having said that, who am I gonna hand off my methadone patients to from, from jail when I don't have a functional methadone clinic in my community that's taking new patients? There's a problem right there. Um, and I can't, I, I'm gonna leave the other two for anybody else that wanted to respond to. Well, I, I can say, you know, from, from our perspective in Berkshire County, we do not seek cash bail. We seek to have people held pretrial who are dangerous uh, to the public safety. And we are working with Community Corrections, which is a part of the state probation department. They, they do an individualized assessment, and they really have the right outlook. I'm thrilled with them. And so we're really working on getting people involved in being assessed and getting uh, into treatment programs and, and helping support people address the underlying reasons that brought them to the court in the first place. So we're really working with defense counsel to do that pretrial so that when it comes time for disposing of their case, we certainly um, will look at that very favorably. That's one tool that we're using. Another thing that I just want to say, borrowing a, a, a strategy of Ruth's and just talking about what I want to talk about. And one thing that I do want to talk about <laughs> that hasn't come up yet is um, how we address the needs of victims of crime in the criminal justice system. So many of the um, domestic violence and sexual assault victims that we see, there's strong correlations between um, substance use disorder and mental health disorder. And you know, the most vulnerable people in our community, we're really putting the focus on getting those um, victims into treatment and getting wraparound services for our victims so that we can uh, protect them and so that we can prosecute perpetrators and get dangerous people out of our community. Thank you. And just to add quickly to, um, and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards as well, but the Family Drug Court does have a clinical team uh, and I'm happy to put you in touch with the person who runs that if that would be helpful. Um, it, we, that said, I think we all agree that there's more work that can be done to sort of have a better integrated system that uh, works for, for, for folks. Um, and I know that we work hard to try to identify some of those gaps. I'm looking at Cheryl uh, in the audience here because I know the Bay State Franklin Medical Center, for example, just recently uh, have lo looking at the bridge clinic so that there, that might be a gap measure while some of these other connections that Ruth talked about in terms of a warm handoff can happen. 
but happy to talk to you more about that if you want to talk to someone about the Family Drug Court. Thank you. Um, this has been such a wonderful panel, and we know that um, you know this issue, it's an existential threat for our community because the impact is not just today, it's also on the future generations. Mm -hmm. So we're gathered here today because it's, it's important and we realize that collaboration and innovation are critical. And I think one theme that has come out out of today is the need for policy that support our efforts because we cannot do that alone. And I have to say in the time that I've been here, what I have seen, and we know that we have a legacy of having um, public policy makers um, who are very committed to this work and who have been um, great advocates for us here in Beacon Hill um, and also uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. So with that, um, before we close, um, I would like to introduce uh, Representative Mindy Dom, who is here in the audience. Um, oh, come on. We'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this as we wrap up this, this last Thank panel. you, President, so much. And I really, I'm Mindy Dom. I represent Amherst, Pelham, and in Precinct 1 in Granby. Um, I have somewhat of a history of working in the harm reduction field. Um, and I want to just say two things. I wanted to give a shout out to community-based organizations, especially Tapestry, and the role that they've played in the region and in the Commonwealth and in the country for decades. So, um, and I can only say decades because I'm old enough now to say decades. Um, but I also just wanted, and I appreciate the shout out to policy because it's policy and resources. And so we're a room of voters. And I hope that people are gonna engage politically and on the community level with your state legislators and with your federal legislators, including me, to make sure that we are giving the resources that are necessary to implement great policy. Great policy by itself is not implementation, it's just great ideas. And hold us accountable. There are a lot of bills in the state legislature right now that push harm reduction forward in our state, and we need to do more. And the only way we're going to do more is when we're told by our constituents that it means something to them. So I encourage everybody, if you're not registered to vote, register. And even if you're not, call your legislator because it's kind of unethical for them to ask you if you're registered to vote before they talk to you. <laughs> um, and demand that we get on the wagon, so to speak, of resources and policy when it comes to harm reduction. Elected officials have sort of taken on the language of harm reduction. Many of us talk about meeting people where they're at. That's harm reduction. Many of us talk about the expertise of our district. That's harm reduction. Hold us accountable when it comes to the money piece because that's the part. I mean, we need the policy piece and the information and the learning so that we can then start to really embrace the funding piece. So thank you for my advertisement. Thank, thank you for all the work that you're doing. So as I turn it over to Dr. Doonan, we'll ask our panelists to each give us one word that you're taking away today as you leave the stage. Uh, passion. Collaboration. Fight hard. <laughs> <laughs> She's got to break the rules every time. <laughs> Perseverance. Transparency. Thank you so much. If you have an incredible moderator, so please, uh, Dr. Solomon Fernandez, outstanding, outstanding job. I, I think I just want to give a special shout out to Deb too, who connected us to many people in the region, and we really, really appreciate that. Let me tell you how we put this panel together. Okay, this is the deal. We interviewed everyone, and 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 these people just blew us away when we talked to them on the, on, on the phone and, and did the interview. The work that you're doing, the passion that you bring to it, my one word because of you all is hope. Okay, for all of you, um, you're gonna get two emails from us. One of us is gonna be a link to the issue brief, the full issue brief, and the other is gonna be an evaluation. We take those uh, very seriously. Look, our work here in Western Mass, really, it was inspiring to us, and it's something that I hope the Mass Health Policy Forum can do can do every year. I want to thank our partnership here uh, with, with UMass, uh, Amherst, and the School of Public Health, and the rest of our sponsors. Thank you.